Hello history fans, should we talk about ancient history? I'll give you a clue as to the specific topic. Not to blow my own trumpet, but I think I smashed that. <laughs> um, for those of you just listening rather than watching, I'm currently wearing a sparkly cowboy hat, which I know is not accurate to Indy's hat, but it's same vibe and I just played the Indiana Jones theme tune on my little trumpy trump so we are going to be talking <laughs> about Indiana Jones today and also for those of you watching I know this microphone is stupidly small and I've got it on a huge stand but I thought if I was holding it or had it clipped to me the audio was just gonna go fuzzy so that's why it looks all out of proportion. We're going to be talking about the real history behind the new Indiana Jones film, which I saw recently and I really enjoyed. It was Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. So spoilers, of course, if you haven't already seen it. But equally, you don't need to have seen it because we're going to just be talking about the history behind it as well. In summary, Indiana Jones is a retired archaeology professor, or he's just retiring, who's trying to take down some time-travelling Nazis Indy and his friend found Archimedes' dial in the 1940s, they fought a Nazi for it then, and then we fast forward to the 60s where the same Nazi is fighting him for it now, so that he can travel back to the 40s and take over from Hitler. But he gets some calculations or something wrong and they end up in ancient Italy at the Roman siege of the city of Syracuse. With that basic summary of the film, let's delve into the real history of the object, the archaeology, and the battle. At the start of the film we briefly see mention of the Lance of Longinus, which is an important and sacred relic of the Christian world, but recent tests revealed it was created in the 7th century AD. Sorry, can you hear me playing with my hair? I'll stop. <laughs> it's first mentioned in the Gospel of John, and later in connection to the Roman centurion Longinus, being the lance that pierced Jesus' side as he hung on the cross. The lance is said to fill its possessor with the ability to conquer kingdoms with ease, so that's why Hitler wants it, I suppose. It's said that the first Holy Roman Emperor, Charlemagne, wielded the lance while marching across Europe in the 9th century, but he dropped it one day and died on the spot. The Nazis trying to find it in the film is also based on historical fact. Hitler saw it on display in Vienna and later ordered the Nazis to bring it to him. And so, it's on a train to Nuremberg on the 13th of October 1938, but it's later seized by the American forces on the 30th of April 1945, just two hours before Hitler committed suicide. So loosely similar to the film, but it's only briefly mentioned and we move on. The main object that's the focus of the film is Archimedes' dial, or the Antikythera, which now lives in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. A fact that Indy would be proud of. You know, it belongs in a museum. <laughs> that was terrible. I'm sorry. But he says that a lot. Anyway, the real Antikythera sadly isn't magical, as it is in the film, but it's still a very mysterious ancient object. It was discovered by divers on a shipwreck in 1901, just off the coast of Greece, as three lumps of corroded bronze alongside other objects like jewellery and marble statues. Conservationists have since divided those lumps into 82 separate fragments that give us some idea of how it would have functioned. I suppose 82 pieces to find would have been a much longer film, so two pieces makes more sense for them to be fighting over. <laughs> the ship is thought to have set sail between the years 70 and 60 BCE, travelling back from the eastern Mediterranean. Initially, researchers thought it was a Roman ship bringing stolen treasure home, but more recent analysis suggests it was a Greek trading vessel taking its cargo back home. Which makes sense either way, the ship was carrying important and varied cargo. There were bronze statues, there was gold, furniture that was thought to be a throne, weapons and amphorae. You will know what an amphorae is, don't you? It carried oil or wine. <laughs> Sorry, I'm presuming you've seen my other videos. <laughs> Of the 82 pieces of the Antikythera, 30 are bronze gear wheels. We have gears and a ring divided into different degrees, which is why it's known as the first analogue computer, created over a millennium earlier than the first mechanical clocks of the 13th century. 
It's said the object would have had a circular face with rotating hands and a handle to wind the mechanism back or forward. So it would have looked the same as clocks now with the bronze mechanism inside a wooden case. <laughs> I don't know why I couldn't think of that word then. The hands would have shown the position of the sun, the moon and the planets we knew then, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. It also had ways to predict the lunar and solar eclipses, like it's like a mini model of the cosmos. There's also inscriptions on the object's surface that tell you what the stars are doing. Really, what more could you need to know as a time-travelling Nazi, clearly? <laughs> I can't remember what he forgets, but Indy realises what he forgets and that's why they end up in the wrong time era. Anyway, so being used for astrology is a pretty good assumption, although they had charged charts for that at the time, so this intricacy isn't necessary in that case, which leads people to believe it was used as a philosophical teaching device. It gives you the knowledge of the universe and how it works in a way that's easy to share with others. The inscriptions explain what's happening in an understandable way and shows that the universe follows predictable mathematical rules that anyone can understand sort of. <laughs> it shows the shift from thinking the gods magically and I guess sporadically controlled the universe to, oh wait, no, it's science that has been carefully created by or carefully designed by a divine creator. So it's a pretty magnificent piece of equipment to have been created in the second century. It shows us what the ancient Greeks were capable of. Just think of how much knowledge we probably have, will definitely have just lost all their knowledge that doesn't survive for us to see. It just gives you some sort of perception of how clever the ancients were. Currently there's no specific dating of the Antikythera. It ranges from 200 to 60 BCE, but most likely people say around 100 BCE. Even though these are really rough dates, they mean it wouldn't have been created by Archimedes, as the film says, as it comes after he died in 212 BCE. But it is suggested Archimedes may have come up with something similar, so he maybe created the basis for these future creations. As the Roman writer Cicero mentions Archimedes constructing a similar machine that represented the celestial movements. Because of this device, we can argue that Archimedes is to thank for the whole line of this type of technology, coming up with the original ideas for machines that have been more and more refined over the years, and ultimately created computers. <laughs> because of the shipwreck's positioning, it's thought that the Antikythera was heading north from Rhodes, after being produced in the workshop of Poseidonius, another mathematician. We think this because Cicero also writes about bronze machines and globes that turn to show the motions of the heavens, one of which he attributed to Poseidonius, who lived in Rhodes in the first century, around the same time that researchers think that the ship the Antikythera was on would have stopped off at the island. It may have even been a special commission piece made by Poseidonius for a rich Greek. In the film, we have the rest of the dial hiding in Archimedes' tomb. This bit's not accurate. If there's any bits still remaining, they're in the ocean. But there's also two codes referenced that they find with clues on them that are meant to trick them about finding the rest of the Antikythera. Those codes are sort of real. Polybius's square is a device used to turn letters into numbers that were then used by fire signalers to send coded transmissions. But rather than linear B being a code, as they say in the film, it's actually a syllabic script found on clay tablets in Crete, which are some of the earliest forms of written Greek, which is quite cool. So symbols rather than a code. But obviously symbols can be a code, so it's like true but not true, you know? Poetic license, I suppose they'd say. <laughs> the Siege of Syracuse did of course happen, before the Antikytheros comes into history though. The Romans tried to take the city in 213 BCE, and Archimedes, con Archimedes contraptions would have, maybe, been there. <laughs> Writers from the period reference Archimedes' claw and Archimedes' death ray. Death ray? What? They didn't have them in ancient times? Well, 
<laughs> the claw was constructed of beams that swung out over the city walls that would drop weights onto the attacking ships, or it might have hooked and lifted the ships up out of the water. The death ray was a curved reflective shield that focused the sunbeams onto the attacking ships, causing them to burst into flames. But of course, history is often literary with flamboyant descriptions. That was difficult to say. <laughs> so whether his inventions actually looked or worked in that way, we'll never know. But since the city was defended against the attackers, it's likely Archimedes did contribute to Syracuse's defences, leading to the siege. The siege eventually ended in 212 BCE, when the festival to the goddess Artemis meant the defences were down, and the Romans managed to breach the city walls. Archimedes was apparently too lost in his equations to notice the invasion, or the Roman soldier that appeared and killed him. I really feel like you would notice someone in armour clamouring up behind you. Maybe he was cat-like. <laughs> the film also includes the mystery of finding Archimedes' tomb. Cicero writes about finding the grave in Syracuse, hidden by bushes of brambles and thorns. Sadly, not quite the epic cave tomb we see in the film. And apparently the people of Syracuse didn't care about the tomb either, and Cicero found it in that mess, tidied it up, and then it got lost again. So let's see if you were listening. <laughs> First question, when was the Antigathera shipwreck found? It was found in 1901, and divers kept going down there for months to bring up as much treasure as possible for the Greek government. I don't think I told you that bit though. <laughs> Number two, what year did Archimedes die? It was 212 BCE. And now the last question, I didn't say it, but I played the music. So who wrote the music to Indiana Jones? They also wrote the music to Star Wars and Harry Potter, loads of stuff. It is of course the legendary John Williams. <laughs> well done if you got any of those. If you did, I'm glad. That means I was engaging enough for you to actually pay attention. Apart from the last question, that just shows you're interested in film music. <laughs> if anyone listening wants to make a new film franchise about magical archaeology, please let me know, because I will gladly play the archaeologist. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening or watching, if you are. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time. Bye! <laughs>